Hello and welcome to Snide's Return, a tabletop role-playing podcast. If you have ever wanted to take your D&D game Super Saiyan, have your character open the eight inner gates, or channel magic like Black Clover, then my guest today can kickstart that into reality. Known for bringing big eyes and small mouths to the gaming table, it is a pleasure to welcome back the man of absolute power. To discuss the anime 5e Kickstarter and future of Discarmy Publishing is the wonderful Mark McKinnon. Mark, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me back on. And I got to say, I'm impressed with the, the number of puns you threw into that intro. That was, that was pretty good. <laughs> uh, I'm still learning, still trying. Uh, so the, some of the things that, that I've touched on there, um, we will get into in a, a large way very shortly. But for those that haven't heard our previous interview, would you mind giving us a, a quick praise of yourself and Discarmy as a publishing company, please? Sure. Well, uh, as you said, my name is Mark McKinnon. I'm the uh, president of Discami Publishing Company, also one of the, the the lead designers for a lot of the games we do. We're a, we're a very small micro company based in Canada, in Ontario. And we've been known for, we started out doing some board games. That's how the company got formed in 2013. And then we moved into doing some licensing with uh, the Sailor Moon Crystal license. We did some tabletop games for that and are still doing uh, new games for that. And then we ended up going back into role playing. So my my business, my start in the industry was with Big Eyes Small Mouth First Edition back in 1997. So Bessem, as it's since been known to to be titled, that was my first game, and then I've really found that I, I enjoyed doing role playing design. Board game design is also very interesting, but I think role playing is where some of my strengths are with my background in science and numbers, and so. The big eyes, small mouth, eventually, you know, getting out of the industry and then coming back in in 2013, it just made sense at some point to get back into role playing. So, uh, Discami licensed uh, Bessem from White Wolf, who owns the property now, and we licensed it for them to do a new fourth edition. And that kind of kick started, so to speak, uh, the company back into doing role playing games. And since then, we've expanded the line. And right now, we're running the Kickstarter for Anime 5e. And, you know, mentioned there in in the title of the, of the the kickstarter anime seems to be a, a huge influence on this on the company and on on the projects and uh, games that you produce and put out taking taking that influences and, and putting them onto this kickstarter that uh, you know I'd, I'd love to 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 hear you sort of take us through and, and tell us more about how has that been drawing those influ- those two almost i won't say opposing but very different uh, influences together. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly with with anime, I've had a long time love with anime. Grew up with Astro Boy and Battle of the Planets, you know, kind of the, the the standard ones when I was younger. And whenever I was looking at getting into role playing a little bit, it, it was based on the fact that I I wanted to play Ronma One Half. Uh, I just loved that show, and I thought, oh my, I, I got to create a game so I can play this with my gaming group friends because it was a lot of fun and and certainly captured my attention. And then it expanded out from there. And I thought, well, you know, if I just make the rules a little more robust and add a few more options, suddenly it can incorporate so much more than just ROM. It can be an anime role-playing game, which, which of course on on the surface level can be a little bit silly because anime is, is not a, a particular genre it's not a show it's it's almost a, a medium so it's like saying well you're going to do the movie role playing game or the television role playing game or the comic role playing game which which on its surface does not make sense but of course there's certain tropes and commonalities that evoke anime feeling and so when i'm playing dungeons and dragons as it is I'm picturing that I'm in the Lord of the Rings movie. I mean, that's mm-hmm. when I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons. It's high fantasy, epic fantasy. But when I'm playing Bessem or Anime 5e, my mind, I'm not seeing the Lord of the Rings movies. I'm seeing the famous anime shows. And so my perspective on what the role playing is from an anime point of view, if you can have rules and artwork and kind of a, a structure that evokes that feeling, even if it's not based on a specific anime series, then I think that then that's kind of what we're trying to go for. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And anime is, of course, hugely popular, and it's very, very diverse. The difference between, you know, Bessem being a multi-genre universal game and anime 5e being specifically fifth edition fantasy anime, uh, you know, there's quite a big difference on that. But they're both trying to evoke the feeling of anime into role-playing, although as I've said many times, any game can be an anime role-playing game. If you picture 
anime in your head when you're playing Call of Cthulhu or when you're playing Starfinder or or Vampire or any of those games. You can make it an anime game by just pretending it's an anime uh, setting and world. But I think the the feeling that we're going for is hopefully reinforced by the rules and the framework that we're presenting. Mm, absolutely. I've just had a, a flash of inspiration for Blood the Last Vampire uh, Vampire the Masquerade, but that, that's uh, that's well off topic from from uh, what we're here to discuss, and that is your hugely successful Kickstarter. Uh, I had an email update me; it's over three hundred thousand and, and still climbing. You must be thrilled. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we were going to launch this, you know, we we did Big Eyes Small Mouth, uh, Best and Fourth Edition. We did that one in twenty nineteen, and it was a great resurrection of the game uh, 1700 people for uh, 140,000 and so there was clearly a demand for Besson to come back which is which is excellent anime 5e i i didn't know how it would be taken by the industry i mean if you, you look at kickstarter and there are seemingly an endless list of fifth edition type products whether they're um books on monsters, books on strongholds and, and NPC books, and you know some, some actual role-playing games as well based on the fifth edition open gaming license. But mm. it's never knowing what's going to strike and what isn't. When you look at the, the stats, you can get some that are over a million or hitting two million. I mean, they're the really, really gigantic games. And then you have others that do a couple thousand or reach a couple hundred people and, and that's it. So given that, that we were primarily known as best and fourth edition we are kind of i'd say independent third party publisher we had not published anything for fifth edition before and so not knowing how it was going to be accepted now what it turned out was it's vastly popular we have over 4100 backers and as you mentioned over 300,000 us right now and there's still two weeks to go in the campaign I mean, we were only eight days into the campaign or nine days mm -hmm. in it's it's still more than halfway to go and we have an incredible volume of people that have clearly told us that they've been waiting for anime Dungeons and Dragons, which of course is interesting because you could play Dungeons and Dragons as an anime game, as I already mentioned, but the specific combination of anime and Dungeons and Dragons seem to be calling to people that were waiting for that. And we're super excited to take not Dungeons and Dragons, it is fifth edition, it's no, it's not D and D. That is a separate game. But fifth edition has the core rule sets with an anime wrapping and an anime feel to it, and bring that out. And it sounds like there's people that have been waiting for that, and, and where you hope that they're really gonna get exactly what they want with anime five E. I mean, yeah, and and with the wrapping you've mentioned, I want to peel that back and unwrap it a little bit. You uh, just on the the Kickstarter page, which has. The, the the wonderful trailer the artwork and and uh has you know it mentions 14 races 14 classes there's there's attributes defects and and skill points and things like that would you mind sort of just dipping into each of those uh, maybe highlighting one or two of each for us just so people get that that flavor of, of really what they can get when they back this this project yeah absolutely so with anime 5 one of the the important differentiations that I, I wanted to stress is that this is a fifth edition game. It's not Dungeons and Dragons, and it's not a, an expansion to Dungeons and Dragons. It is a standalone game that uses the fifth edition system with some rebalancing through a point-based mechanism, or we call it like a reimagined uh, system. And so we also very heavily go into effects-based version of it. So if you're into RPG kind of game theory between effects-based versus power-based. What we do is we provide the tools and the framework within the, the features that the characters can do to have a particular, F, something happen in effects. For example, flight, I wanna fly. So great, then you take the flight ability, but we're not telling you why you're flying. You decide that. So it could be I have wings or I'm using magic or psionics or anti-gravity powers or some sort of technology, fantasy technology, we don't determine the parameters. That's up for you to determine because we want to make sure that you can create the character that you want and envision that, that you want from your race and class and whatnot, where we are focusing on what the effect is. And that's a little different than, than say, Dungeons and Dragons with their, you know, they will have a magic missile and a fireball and a lightning bolt. And they all kind of do a very similar thing. They, they, inflict damage upon an opponent, but there are three different abilities. Well, we would have one ability, which would be a weapon. We call it the weapon. And you can determine how that weapon manifests according to what you want it to do. 
So with the going into Anime 5e, with the, the first and foremost in mind, this is a fifth edition game. It's not Bessem. It's not Dungeons and Dragons. It's a fifth edition anime game. Then what we've tried to do is evoke that anime feeling through what we're presenting. But we don't want to hit the, I guess, the over-stereotyped anime. I mean, this is not sub-dimensional hammers that you pull out of space and panty shots and and all the... the there, there's so much that is very trope-like in anime. And we tried not to go overly far on that. So with the race selections, we do some races that are, you know, kind of a, a little original and, and a little different than you, what you might expect to see in all anime. But it presents a version of an anime race that you can have. So one of the things, for example, is we have the Azrai. Azrai are kind of living angels. They're, they're sylvan-like. They're kind of elvish-like. They come from, um, you know, the woodlands and they're very much in tune with nature, but they fly. Uh, they're, they're cute and they're kind of delicate. So that's, that's a little different. That might not be as common in anime, but then we also have the slime. And so, you know, that has not been a long time in anime trope, but certainly recently with uh, that time I got reading that incarnated as a slime as being a very popular anime show. You, the fact that you can play a slime uh, is a little bit different from, say, your your standard fighter or your your standard dwarf, elf, and, and hobbit, for example. We also have stuff like uh, you can play very large creatures, and that's something that goes against what a lot of fifth edition do. Is you can we have races that are very different sizes. So we have the archfiend, which is huge. Uh, we're talking 20 to 30 feet tall as a player character race. So you're probably not going to be sitting around in the inn drinking beer with the rest of your party members uh, unless it's a very, very big inn. So those are there's some of the races that we have. In terms of classes, again, we did hit some of the, some of the more common anime tropes. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we represented that. So uh, not only just anime, but also, I guess, maybe more Eastern. So we have like the ninja and we have the samurai, very standard fighting type. But we also have stuff like magical girls, which uh, while usually in anime is done in a modern type setting, be it Sailor Moon or, or Cardcaptor or Sakura. But in this case, you'd be a magical girl in a fantasy setting, which, which still works very well. And we also have something like uh, pet monsters trainer. So your standard Pokemon, for example, that you're actually going to be training your monsters and maybe you're not great at fighting, but you have people or creatures that that come along with you. They're your companions and these companions can help you do things um, as well as some that are a little bit a little bit off kilter and something you would not see expect to see in a fifth edition dungeon crawling type game. So we have something called a broker, which these would be your people that have uh, their merchants. They have great networks of people. They're connected. I mean, if you want something, you're going to go to these people. If you have a, a party and you have ventures and you have to get equipped, like your, your brokers, they can make sure that you have what you need to get going. And so a lot of their abilities are more social, less fighting, because while this is a fifth edition game, this is not a dungeon crawling game. We've tried to expand Anime 5e away from the, the mind frame that role playing equals combat in a dungeon, you know, going in, killing creatures and taking their stuff. That's fine if that's what you want to play. There's nothing wrong with that and certainly very common in, in a lot of anime as well. But that's not the focus that we're trying to give is a more narrative structure. It's like, what about all the time you spend in the, the city and the village and the countryside and all of the social interactions that you're having that have nothing to do with fighting, but there's such a rich tapestry of narrative stories that you can be telling through role playing, which is what it's kind of like our gaming philosophy. And I'm trying to bring that to fifth edition and make it less dungeon crawly and more role playing. And so those are some of the, the kind of the classes and the races that we have to evoke those that anime epic story feel through uh, the anime setting, which is also going to be compatible with your standard fifth edition games, should you want to go that route. Mm. And uh, so putting the 2D6 to one side, if you do play Bezman and picking up the D20 and playing one of these arch fiends you've mentioned there or one of the others that are of varying size, uh, have you, you've you taken sizing and um, how that works within the frame of, of, a, of the 5e game. Uh, you've applied logic, is that fair? You sort of played with the mechanics, should we say? Yeah, I, I think I think that's a that's a fair. I mean, I don't I don't want to say that you know a, a different person's game design was illogical, uh, no. but what what D and D or standard fifth edition is evoking may be a little different than what we were trying to do because we were trying to represent things maybe a little more 
concrete or, or, or rational approach to doing things. As an example, I mean, a, a simple thing is size. And this is something that one of the biggest changes in our, in our anime 5e is probably how we handle size of creatures or characters, which is different than fifth edition. And if someone wants to use the standard fifth edition way of doing size, that that's fine. But we present an alternate way. And I always look at an example of say a halfling in in standard fifth edition so a halfling is small so we're talking about say three feet tall so a human being six feet halfling being three feet so in standard fifth edition a human moves at 30 feet per round where halfling moves at 25 feet so just slightly under now if any of you have ever had kids uh you know certainly when my kids were very small about three feet tall there's no way that they could keep up anywhere near with the speed that I would walk. I mean, their little legs would have to be scurrying like crazy, like the little Speedy Gonzales from the old uh, uh, Bugs Bunny <laughs> cartoons. And that's something that we look and say, well, if you're going to be half the size, your speed is going to be proportionally uh, reduced as well because your, your legs are not going to have as big of a stride. And so a standard small-sized player character or creature would have a speed half of 30, 30 being the base. So they'd be moving at 15 instead of say 25. And then it's not just size. It's also everything that's associated with, with movement related to size, movement and ability in combat. And the example that we use in the book is if you were to stand at one end of the field and fire a bow and you're trying to hit uh, on the other end of the field, a penny, a human and a barn, you know, what could you hit more likely? Well, of course the barn is much easier to hit because it's larger. So that Im that implies that when you are trying to attack something that is large, you have a different chance than if you're trying to attack something that is small. I mean, the classic second edition AD&D uh, power of the, the dwarves have an advantage of fighting against giants. And part of it was, you know, the, the racial hatred that might go on between them. But it's also, I think, the, the idea that a very small creature like a dwarf can kind of slide between the giant's legs. And it makes the giant difficult for a giant to hit something small. And we took the sizes and we looked at it and said, well, wouldn't it make sense then if attacking small things gave you a disadvantage and attacking big things gave you a bonus? And that plies into everything from armor class to um, damage resistance. So if, if you do manage to hit, say, a fairy, like a, a couple of inches tall, if I manage to hit a fairy, I'm going to do significantly more damage than I would if I hit another human, as an example. So my character. And so you're going to be doing more damage against smaller creatures than you or, or less damage against larger creatures. And so our approach to size was, I, I agree, kind of taken with the idea of being a more rational, reasonable approach and looking at I don't want to say real world physics because that gets a little too technical, but uh, something that uh, scales up from a, a logical point of view that if I'm a, a human right now and I pick up a sword and suddenly the sword and I grew to being 100 feet tall or 30 feet tall or 50 feet tall, that I would still be able to lift that sword if we proportionally increased in weight. Well, in standard fifth edition, I couldn't lift that sword anymore because your strength does not scale with your size, which would be, you know, say a one eighth multiplier because you know, humans and, and creatures have length and height and depth to us. So we we are we scale based on eight times. And the system as it currently stands in fifth edition doesn't really scale in the same way. So certainly I'm glad you brought up sizes because it is one of the biggest differences. And it's probably going to be the one thing most players who are, if they're hardcore fifth edition players are going to say, this is totally different. And I don't like this because it's not what, what fifth edition style of play is. But we think presenting something that's a little different and, and unique presentation allows us to create the game that we wanted to create hmm. and you mentioned style there and and uh and previously in this interview that that sort of narrative style that that flows through um and sort of really carries the stories beyond just the hack and slash uh xp gathering that uh, potentially other fifth edition games sort of maybe focus on um so moving slightly away from the point i was trying to make because i lost my thread um if someone has has been listening to this and thinks you know what that that sounds like the kind of i want that narrative i want to play with with these new mechanics and see what it's like and they were to go to kickstarter today what would they get for for their uh backing of the project yeah when 
We offered a number of different pledge tiers, as most Kickstarters do, of course, according to what people are looking for. And so our, our base concept, of course, is a, is a printed core role-playing game. It's 272 full-color pages, hardcover. I mean, think of it as your, your standard game that you'd buy in a store. And so that's that's a $50, um, you know, of course, prices are US. Uh, so a $50 US is the standard pledge. But if you only want a PDF version and not have to ship the physical product, maybe you just like PDFs more, then it would be half that. So you're looking at 25. And that's kind of the, the base model. But from there, we have a couple different options. And one of them would be uh, we've produced a pocket edition. So what we did is we we took the 272 pages, full color hardcover, shrunk it down to manga sized, made it soft cover and using the uncoated manga like stock, which is a, a less expensive, more uh, ephemeral paper stock, I guess. It's not meant to have the, the same durability that a, that a full glossy page does. And by doing that, what we've managed to do is, is keep the price down much lower and the page count goes up. But of course, because it's it's smaller and it's only soft cover and it's black and white and the pages aren't glossy, because of that, we have managed to get the, the book itself as a pocket edition that we're calling it down to $25 or only 13 for the PDF version. So you can come in to Anime 5e and get the full experience at just 13, which will be the, the, the PDF of the pocket, or you can go 25 for the pocket edition in print or 25 for the PDF of the core book, 50 for the full edition of the core book. And then beyond that, we have expansion products that we, that we threw in that some people might want, whether it's a deluxe limited edition signed and numbered with gilded edges and bookmarks and a, and a book j or dust jacket, just a gorgeous edition. And this is something we're, we're not offering to retail stores. So that you can add on. And we also have a game screen with adventure. We have a character folio. And so if some of these other packages, whether they're 100 or 300, depending on kind of what you want to get, it does go above the, the $50 pledge. Although certainly the most popular pledge that we have is the standard $50 pledge, which gives you that that hardcover book that people want, but then very close to it is going to be the the package of $100, which includes the book and the game screen and a pocket edition and a character folio. So it's a, it gives you everything you need to kind of get started right away. Mm, absolutely. And, and I've backed it for the pocket edition, uh, soft cover, because that sounded too cool to turn down, uh, though it sounded brilliant to me anyway. Um, and as with, with other Kickstarters, do you have sort of the, the stretch goals to unlock and things like that? Or is, is that just tied into the, the tiers of pledging? Yeah, no, we certainly do have stretch goals. Uh, the way we run Kickstarters is we come up with what we consider a fair kind of minimum pledge amount. Then we thought, well, if we can get $10,000 from our backers, then that will give us enough to do a moderate size print run and get the game out into market. And then we'd end up getting some additional sales when it gets into retail stores and PDF sales on drive through RPG. So we thought 10,000 was, was a minimum. And if we hit that, that's, we could go ahead and, and produce the game. And hopefully there'd be enough people that would want that. Of course, you always hope you're going to reach more audience just the way any uh, manufactured product, you're going to want to hopefully sell more. And so what we did is we came up with stretch goals so that if we receive more funds that exceeds what we consider our minimum, then we can give more back to the, the pledges, the, the backers that supported us. We want to give back to that. And as we started out, um, we thought, oh, this is great. We have a couple of stretch goals here and there. And then it really started taking off. And going up from our minimum of 10,000 up to 300,000 now, that was a huge number of stretch goals that we've had. So we have about 30 different stretch goals unlocked already uh, with more coming. Every time we meet a new stretch goal, we, we put a new one up and our backers knock it down and reach that tier. And so we put up with another one and, and our backers reach that one as well. So we're offering a lot of additional content, whether it's digital, uh, a lot of a lot of digital extra stuff we're gonna be providing after the Kickstarter. There's been physical upgrades to the book, whether it's the, you know, for some cover finishes or some additional ni nice um, you know, bookmarks that we're gonna be attaching with bookmark ribbons to so keep your place. So it's kind of a combination of physical upgrades as well as digital upgrades and and uh, additional content. And then, you know, with two weeks left in the campaign, we're going to be unlocking some really interesting things going forward. We have free product that people can can get that we, we pledge a certain levels and tire other games uh, because it was unlocked at a certain level. We're going to be looking at doing some some more innovative things uh, come in the future. We have a poster that we shipped, a, a, a printed bookmark. There's so many stretch goals because the community has rallied together to really support this. And we want to make it as good 
good as we can for everyone that has backed the project. Mm, absolutely, and and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to to getting more emails and more updates and and finding out as as the the, the campaign the project develops. Uh, and you mentioned there the future. So clearly, this uh, anime five E project has has really caught the imagination and sort of is is progressing tremendously well and and being well supported. What does that mean for uh, your current leases like Besom 4E and other things you have coming in the future? Where where are you as a company with, with those products? Yeah, and that, that's a great question because we, we have a timeline and a release schedule and projects we've been working on uh, for a while. So when someone sees something promoted or put on Kickstarter, that's after you know, months, years of development work that goes into those, of course. And we had the plan for 2021 and we have some of the outlines of plans for 2022, what we're trying to do. And we're a small company, of course, there's not a lot of resources we had in terms of uh, human capital. We use a lot of freelancers for doing writing and, and artwork. And then I do a lot of design work uh, as well. And so we had the plan. And of course, you know, with the success of the NMA 5e Kickstarter, we're going to have to revisit that plan and, and take a look. It's like, well, clearly there's a desire for this product. So how do we support that going forward as well as other plans? So just looking at the the timeline that we have for 2021, once, of course, this was the releasing it, the Kickstarter in the spring, we're going to be sending out PDFs shortly after the Kickstarter ends, and then the idea of getting this printed, and it would be a fall release. That was kind of always the project for Anime 5e. But during the summer, we actually are going to be doing a, a crowdfunding campaign for what we call TriStat micro games or, or mini games. So what we did is we took the TriStat system, which is the underlying system used in Besson 4th edition. That's kind of our game. It's not 5th edition. It's TriStat system. And we came out with three different mini games uh, surrounding those. So one of them is called Pixies, where you're playing, uh, you know, basically Pixies that live in a house. And, you know, you can think of the Borrowers or Arietti. It's, it's along those lines. It's not, not anime. This is just a TriStat system games where you're going to be pay, playing wee creatures living in a human world. That was one of them. The second one we have is called Worms. And what this is, is you're playing dragons, just giant dragons. And think of it, we, we kind of elevator pitch it as kind of a Voltron Highlander cannibal dragons. Uh, it's a little complex, but you're, you're going to be playing dragons that, you know, you and the other people in the party can combine into the giant worm, which is there's only a few of those in the world, and they are all trying to eliminate each other. Uh, and so it is a game that's going to involve a very different perspective where you're playing a dragon and that is what the game is all the player characters are dragons and then the third of the first three of these mini games is called demonicity and this is where you're a, a group of human or human-like uh, people who are going in and, and you're trying to stop an, a demon invasion of a city. And so demonicity, you're going in there, you ha might have some demon-like powers and you're fighting against the coming evil darkness. And so those three games are each box sets. They each come with uh, rule sets and um, some scenarios, some player characters pre-generated already. And these are designed to kind of pick up and go with it right away. Unlike Best and Fourth Edition, which is our current release of the the most recent TriStat system, where that is a, a multi-genre universal system that is designed to handle everything and in any setting. These mini games are very specific to a very specific type of setting. So Pixies is all about being small and living in a human world. I mean, that's a, a much more restricted setting. And so these mini games are a way for us to take the TriStat system as presented in, in Bessem and have a different expression of it with some some new ways of looking at the rules and some new presentations. We think it's a very interesting line uh, of doing it this way. And so those three are going to be uh, crowdfunded in the summer and that'll be sometimes you know, released by the end of the year. And then moving forward, the other big project that we had for 2021 is Absolute Power. And this is our superhero role-playing game that uses, again, the underlying TriStat system that's in Best and Fourth Edition, but it takes it up, you know, turns it up to, to dial 11, effectively, because it is, you know, superheroes are much bigger and uh, grander than most anime characters. That's not to say you can't have your Dragon Ball Z style, uh, which are obviously hugely powerful, but when you're playing people on the Avengers level or the JLA level, you're playing superheroes 
they're they're going to be bigger and more powerful and grander than what's typical in most anime. And so what we're doing is when we, uh, we being the previous company that I was involved with, so we did Silver Age Sentinels, which was a game that came out in 2001. This was a superhero game. And at the time it used the Tristat system, but it used an early, earlier implementation of it. And it was a really great superhero game. Well, it's now 20 years later, and the world from Silver Age Sentinels has progressed 20 years as well. And so the setting has advanced. It's unlike Bessem, which doesn't really have a like a, a concrete built-in setting, the Absolute Power does have a setting, and that is the, the world of Absolute Power. And the reason why the, the name has changed, it's not Silver Age Sentinel 2nd Edition, it is Absolute Power, which kind of reflects during these 20 years of progress of the world that the heroes are, are always pushed to grab just a little more power to keep people safe. And it's the, you know, comes from the the old expression about how power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And the heroes are under this constant pressure to be bigger and faster and more brutal and to to just grab more power so that they can you know, defeat the, the the villains and the world the world crushing threats that come up, and so this is a really good expansion on what we presented in Best and Fourth Edition, but it's just on a, a bigger and grander scale. So this is a game that we've been putting a lot of resources in over the past year to rewrite the the, the historical section as it moves forward over this twenty years, where some of the characters have died, some of them have you know, change sides. Uh, and uh, it's a really great progression with with an excellent cast of uh, NPCs built in. So that one, we're looking at crowdfunding by the end of the year, and it's probably gonna be an early ish 2022 release. Um, so that was the that was the plan for this year. We also have a couple more things that I can't talk about. We have some licensed stuff, uh, licensed anime that we're probably gonna be working on. Um, we're just finalizing some details on some of those anime licenses. So we had a number of products planned. And then of course, Anime 5e was originally like, well, here's the core book and here's the game screen and here's the folio. And that could be the entire line. If it was not six overly successful on Kickstarter, great. We produced a great game and we're happy with it. But now of course, well, how do we support the people that are gonna want that built-in support for Anime 5e? The one advantage, a really big advantage that Anime 5e has is because it's built on 5th edition and because it integrates with all other 5th edition products, there is such a wealth of expansions and supplements and rules and settings that if people wanted to get another monster for Anime 5e or they wanted to get a, a kingdom for Anime 5e, th there's a wealth of information out there. And so we're really happy that we have a, a game that we've created that is already has that built-in support. But of course, you know, yes, we, we believe that we can present it in a slightly different way by doing our own anime 5e style expansions. And that's going to be something that we're, we're retooling and looking at how do we support uh, all of our lines moving forward, given the capacity for our company. We're, we're never going to be the size of Wizards of the Coast or Fantasy Flight or, or but if it's, we're ever going to be a large company, that's not where we are. We are a small company, but we produce mighty stuff. Mm, absolutely. Um... Or not to throw in another pun there unintentionally, uh, and you, you, you know, just mentioned there you're going from the very small with pixies to the, the demonic with demonicity, which is um, certainly one that caught my eye. I've written that down. Absolute power again. I'll be looking for that at the end of the year. Um, but what about what about Bessem itself? Um, of extras course, <laughs> recently came out. Is there is there anything on on the horizon f to to continue to support that core line? Yeah, it's actually a little embarrassing forgetting about Bessem Fourth Edition, which is our, our flagship at this point. So, yeah, let me let me talk a little bit about that. I appreciate the uh, the introduction on. It. So, when we released uh, the first wave through the very first Kickstarter, it was it was six products that we have seven if you include the primer, and so that was a foundational, really strong launch that we're happy with. But we knew we had to follow it up with uh, another core product. Think of it as as an essential book of options, essential being you're going to want to get this, but they're optional. You don't have to use everything in it. And that was called Bessem Extras. And so when we did the most recent Kickstarter for Bessem 4th Edition as an expansion package, that was back in November of 2020. And so what that was, well, we had Bessem Extras, which is a book of option roles. We had an NPC book. We had a dice tower. We had several different products uh, and animities, which are these flat mini miniatures like cardboard standees. So we created a package of six 
expansion products for Bessem 4th edition. So within a very short period of time, Bessem in terms of what the people can get in stores and get in their hands, went from zero products for the past decade to more than a dozen products within a very short period of time. We want to do more and we have more planned, but we also thought, well, now we have so much out there that we produce a, a really strong launch of the line. Let's take a step back to work on some of these other projects that we have, knowing that we still need to do more work for Bessem, but because of the the ramp up of time that we needed. We wanted to make sure that we were doing it correctly and giving fans what they needed and also not over committing resources in areas that weren't working. So the the next big Bessem book is called the Bessem Multiverse. And this is our setting book. So we go into the Bessem Multiverse overall framework and introduction to it in Bessem core book, the fourth edition. But what we're going to do is do a separate standalone book about the multiverse, which goes into each of the, the prime worlds and, the, and the, the outer worlds, which is kind of like a concentric rings of different genres and worlds. And all of these different worlds not only are just a setting, but they also represent a genre as well. So Bazaroth, for example, as a world, this is your world of demons, but it also serves as a genre for anime, which is the horror genre. Or we have um, Icarus, which is uh, a high fantasy, high magic, sword and sorcery style setting, but it's also the fantasy setting book. And so what we're going to be doing is taking all of these and expanding out in the best of multiverse. But we're not coming out with that immediately because we, first of all, had some foundational things to lay for other games like Anime 5e and the TriStack games, but also wanted to make sure that we had the right people working on the project. And, and we've since found those, which is great. Um, so we have people lined up to work on that. And that's going to be more released in the best and fourth edition line coming out in 2022. We don't really have any larger projects for specifically for Bessem planned for 21. But these, because it uses the TriStat system, the three different TriStat mini games, uh, the Worms and Pixies and Demonicity, they are they can integrate very well with your fourth edition. And same with Absolute Power, although it's at a higher power scale, it, the what we're presenting in there also integrates with Best and Fourth Edition. And you know, superheroes and anime go really well together in My Hero Academia, for example. So mm. the, the those all the tri stack games, the advantage of using a single system, the same way that fifth edition works for all the things related to, to fifth edition, the tri stat system as a foundational system allows us to create new and interesting expansions and games that also serve as expansions for the existing Bessem fourth edition. And so while a specific Bessem book, uh, a new print product might not be coming out in 2021, um, we have a lot of support product coming out with other TriStack games. But I will say that one thing that we've decided to do with Kickstarter when we released the, the six products in November is in retail stores, we decided not to flood six products in February all into the retail stores at once. So in terms of a, a retail exposure, we are of those six, we're releasing two in February, two in April, and then two in June. So kind of a bit of a staggered release to extend the the life cycle in the, the retailer field, taking those six products that we have and kind of stretching it out a little bit. So it's something that, you know, if we had the capacity, we could have been doing more for Bessem, of course. But I think that we are pivoting in a very interesting way to to do better for the TriStat system, which ultimately I think will, will benefit the, the Bessem fans as well. Absolutely. And uh, mentioned it a couple of times, uh, the company itself and, and your releases. So something we, we haven't done in this interview yet is where can we find uh, yourselves on social media and on the internet in general? Yeah, so we're Discami, D-Y-S-K-A-M-I is our name. And at Discami is, is our kind of our default, whether it's a Twitter handle or Instagram. If you look up Discami on Facebook, you'll see us Discami.ca. We're a Canadian company, so not .com, but Discami.ca is our uh, company website. And then we've also have some uh, like Anime5e.com. That is a kind of a redirection and Bessem 4, best, the number 4, Bessem 4 dot life. Uh, we thought Bessem 4 life would be kind of a funny way of putting it, but Bessem 4 dot life. So that is a redirect as well. So at Discami, we're, we're certainly very common. It's not a, a it's not a normal English usage name. We, you know, we know that it's Discami has uh, some foreign language interpretations of it uh, from Polish, I believe. But uh, if you just look up Discami on any of the socials, we're active on Facebook, certainly active on Twitter and Instagram. And also there is the, although it's not done by us, there is a very, very active uh, TriStat community, so a Besson community on 
uh, Discord. So it's a TriStat fan server, and we link to it from our website if anyone's curious about that. So uh, yeah, there's there's lots of different resources where people can go and connect with other people in the community that are Besson players or TriStat players and give a lot of, lot of advice. It's such a great welcoming, welcoming and inclusive community that is is so great to help each other because um, really that that's why we do all this is to make sure that 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 community connection is so important for us and so we're, we're just love to see it uh, happening online in so many places yeah absolutely and i for one i'm a member of that discord community so if you want to come say hi to me i'm there as well um self plug 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 um so having sort of gone through what makes up anime 5e and the kickstarter and, and all those sort of good things and all the the amazing things that you're doing with uh, Discami and, and and the products you're putting out. What what has been your your favourite part of? We'll, we'll stick with we'll stick with Anime Five E. What has been your favourite part of that to develop, or what would be a character, for instance, that you would create within the system? Yeah, dude, that's that's a really good question. I mean, what I really liked about the the creation is um, it's not so much the specifics of the character because I mean, while I love many of the races and the classes, a lot of it just really comes down to the the point based integration of fifth edition and then deconstructing what fifth edition was uh, down to its its fundamental pieces and then building a whole game anime 5e back up from those fundamentals from a balanced point-based approach on it and it was just fascinating when you start getting into it and digging into the the details and the ramifications of you know x plays with y which plays with z and here's how all these things interact with each other it just creates a, a fascinating way to to create an rpg based on these balanced and internally consistent uh ways of looking at things but if i was to choose you know, one uh, anime five E race that I love. It has to be the slime, and I'm a, I'm a really big uh, slime fan. And so I always thought that at playing something uh, like an isekai student who's a slime, obviously that's very much um, within the lines of uh, the reincarnated anime. But um, there's so many different ways to take the races and the classes and putting them together in, in fascinating places. But I'd say a, a slime pet pet monster trainer, uh, and then the pet monsters would actually be humans, I think would be just a, an incredibly <laughs> fun character to play. So uh, so yeah, I think that's what I'd like to do. Oh, no, that sounds that sounds a lot of fun and, and brilliant. Um, Mark, it, it's, it's been such a pleasure to have you back on the show. And I'd love to have you back on later in the year, uh, perhaps uh, to discuss Absolute Power or, or the other uh, mini TriStat games you've mentioned, if you'd be willing to come back again. Yeah, I have a great time every time I'm talking with you, and you know, I really appreciate the invitation and the chance to to reach out to your community uh, of listeners about some of the stuff that we're doing, and uh, we think we're we're worth keeping an eye on. So so thanks. I would love the idea to come back. Yeah, no, definitely. I'll definitely send that invitation out nearer the time. Um, so it has been an absolute pleasure Um so I, I look forward to uh, the Kickstarter's successful completion and receiving my copy and getting to play with my group. Uh, genuinely excited to see how this all plays out. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I hope everyone will, uh, will take a look at anime5e.com. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about the show, then go to www.snydersreturn.squarespace.com. Alternatively, you can find us over on Twitter, at Return Snyder. We have a link tree link in the description of this episode and if you want to support us come and join us over on patreon and we also have a discord server uh, please leave us a review because we'd love to learn how to improve the channel and provide better content out for for those who are listening uh, until we uh, until we speak again thank you <laughs>